Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here. I'm Rob Saldine. I teach uh, political science here at the University of Montana. I also direct the project on American democracy and citizenship, one of the co-sponsors of this conference, along with the Mansfield Center, the Mansfield uh, program, uh, Ethics and Public Affairs Program, and the President's Excellence Fund. On behalf of these sponsors and my co-organizers, I'd like to uh, welcome you here to the second day of the 2013 Mansfield Conference, A Future of Healthcare in America, Balancing Individual Rights and Social Responsibility. Um, we'd also, uh, this morning, like to uh, give a special thanks to our planning committee, uh, Anthony Johnstone, Mark Hansen, Larry White, and Albert Borgman in particular. Uh, for those of you who were here last night, uh, you saw Jack Mudd offer what I thought was a fantastic introduction to the conference by framing some of the key healthcare issues we face in America today and the tension between individual rights and community responsibility. So today we're going to be diving into some of those issues. Uh, what I want to do here uh, very briefly is just quickly preview what's to come later today and then we'll uh, jump into this morning session. So we have three sessions during the day and then our featured session later this evening. All of these sessions except for uh, uh, tonight's will take place right here in this room and the evening session is going to be held just down the hall in the UC theater. So this afternoon, uh, our, our next session after this one, at one o'clock we'll hear Ovik Roy who uh, will also be joining us as a respondent on this session. Uh, but this afternoon, he'll be proposing an alternative to the Affordable Care Act, and will be outlining a conservative vision for achieving universal coverage. That'll be followed at three o'clock by Mark Hall, who will ask whether the young should be subsidizing the old in America. Then this evening, those two will be back on stage to serve as respondents for our other two featured speakers, Megan McArdle and Jim Marone, who will directly engage the theme of the conference, that is, this tension between individual rights and community responsibilities as it plays out in healthcare. But we begin today with Jim Marone and his talk, Political Battles Over Healthcare, Past, Present, and Future. After Jim's talk, he'll be joined on stage by respondents Ovik Roy and Jeremy Johnson and me as moderator. And this general format, by the way, is going to be uh, the same for the two afternoon sessions today as well as tomorrow morning's session. So with that, here's a bit about our participants in this session. First, our respondents. Ovik Roy is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the author of a must-read blog for anyone interested in health policy that's uh, housed at Forbes. He's also a columnist for National Review, and he was the former healthcare advisor to Mitt Romney. He's also a rising star on the television circuit where he's established himself as a regular guest on cable news shows as well as programs like The Real Time uh, with Bill Maher where he has uh, the dubious task of having to have serious policy discussions with people from Hollywood. Uh, Ovik is one of the sharpest people out there on health policy today and I think in particular he's the, the go-to person if you want to hear a smart, thoughtful, and fact-based critique of the Affordable Care Act and the assumptions underpinning it. Our other respondent is Jeremy Johnson. Jeremy is an assistant professor of political science at Carroll College, where he teaches courses on American politics and public policy. Um, he's also one of Montana's foremost academic experts on American social policy. He's currently working on a book manuscript entitled The Republican Welfare State, Social Policy Reinvention from Nixon to Obama. But first, we'll hear from Jim Marone. Jim is a professor of political science and urban studies at Brown University. He's written eight books, including The Heart of Power, Health and Politics in the Oval Office, From Roosevelt to Bush, and Hellfire Nation, The Politics of Sin in American History, which was a Pulitzer Prize nonfiction nominee. Jim is simply one of the finest political scientists in the business. And I think one of Jim's greatest strengths is his ability to do substantive research that's taken seriously by his political science colleagues, but to also at the same time be able to write and to speak in a manner that engages a well-informed audience of non-specialists. And this is something that's uh, altogether too rare in academia. 
Please help me welcome Jim Marone. All right, well, let me start all the way at the beginning. In 1911, a professor decided we had crossed the Great Divide. 1911 was the first year that the random patient going to the random doctor in a random city in America was more likely to be helped than harmed by the encounter with medicine. 1911. In 1912, Theodore Roosevelt first threw national health insurance on the agenda, running as a third party candidate in the Bull Moose campaign. In 1915, New York and California came very close to passing national health insurance. The American Medical Association supported it in California till doctors rose up, fired the entire board of the national, of the American Medical Association, put in a bunch of people who didn't want national health insurance, defeated it in California, and created a reputation for the American Medical Association, the AMA, of being a, a powerful lobby in the very early era of lobbies at all. This was new to American politics. The story of modern national health insurance goes into eclipse after 1950 and after those defeats, but comes back in 1935. Franklin Roosevelt proposes Social Security, and the liberals in his administration are very keen to put national health insurance in the Social Security package. Roosevelt takes a look at the AMA, all set to attack, and says no. Puts it aside, but throughout his administration, the liberals keep saying, please, you got to do it. We can win it. It'll be a difference. And Roosevelt keeps holding them off. He doesn't think he can get it through Congress. In 1943, it becomes clear that the United States is going to win World War II. And Franklin looks around for another great cause. What could be tougher than defeating the Nazis? Beating the AMA. So he decides, in so far as we can tell with Roosevelt, you're never quite sure with that guy, but in so far as we can tell, he seems to decide that his next great cause after World War II is going to be, as he himself put it, beating the boys in Chicago, the American Medical Association. So he takes his most trusted advisor, Sam Rosenman, and he has, says, Sam, write me a national health insurance plan. Roosevelt doesn't really care about the details and write me a, 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 a script for winning this thing in Congress. That's what he really cared about. The Rosenman uh, committee goes off. Their memos are fascinating. At one point, someone writes to Rosenman and says, I've worked on a lot of dull issues in this administration, but nothing is more boring than health care. Um, and I found that in the file, and I, I've got it uh, framed over my desk now. Nothing is more boring than health care. But we'll, we'll, we'll try to avoid that, that trap. Uh, anyway, they come up with a plan, and they are set to send it to Roosevelt when Roosevelt dies. And there's this new guy in the White House, Harry Truman. No one knows anything about him. Machine politician from Missouri. Um, <clears throat> has only been a vice president for four months, barely even met Roosevelt, and he gets this plan. What's he going to do with it? No one knows. He grasps it and makes it the cause of his career. And it passes from him, he never wins it, of course, down through the administrations. For Democrats, the last great echo, the last legacy of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And for Republicans, a much more complicated story. Ironically, as I'll tell you in a minute, Republicans have been more successful with this, uh, with, with health care. But now I'm getting ahead of my story. Punchline from this introduction, there's no escaping health care. Every president has had to deal with it in a substantial way. Some tried to duck, but none succeed in ducking it. So today I want to do th three things. First, briefly, I want to look at the two parties and their healthcare stances. Second, I want to give you the lessons across history of the battles over healthcare. I'll call up part two the dirty, rotten secrets of health reform. And part three, I want to very briefly look at how politics is the same and how it's different. There's a feeling that somehow Washington has changed in the last five, 10 years. In some ways that's true and in some ways it isn't and I wanna sort that out uh, because that's gonna have a lot to do with the future. So, 
Part one, the parties and health care. Let's go back to Truman for a second. Truman gets this plan and pushes it forward, throws it on the table in Congress, and runs into unprecedented opposition. Back in 1946-47, the idea of running a campaign against a piece of legislation was unheard of. The one possible precedent was prohibition, not drinking. Uh, but that's another story, and we won't get into it now. There's no precedent for it. The American Medical Association hires a public relations firm, Whitaker and Baxter, who put 26 uh, specialists on the job of defeating national health insurance. And what a job they did. They, all kinds of things you still hear today. For example, one of their specialists came up with the quote that Lenin said, Vladimir Lenin said that socialized medicine is the keystone. I'm sorry, uh, national health insurance is the keystone to the socialist arch, to the arch of communism. Well, it's a made up quote, it's wonderful, it sounds just great, and during the Red Scare, you can imagine, this really resonated. But the quote sticks. If you, if you do a Google search on this, you'll find that every time national health insurance comes up, there comes Lenin again with that fake quote. And I, as a political scientist, I say this not to criticize the AMA, but to applaud a, such a success. I mean, you know you've told a successful, um, a, a successful story if 30, 40 years later, people are still repeating your misquotation. So extraordinary job from Whitaker and Baxter and from the AMA. Here's the dirty, rotten secret. It didn't matter. Congress wasn't going to pass this thing. In, first, they had to strip the financing out of the bill. So there was no financing in Truman's National Health Insurance Bill. Why? Because the Senate Finance Committee wasn't going to pass this thing. So they put it in without financing so that it could go to a more sympathetic committee, one run by James Murray, I believe of Montana, the richest man in the Senate at the time. James Murray was a friend of Roosevelt's and he said, uh, of, of Truman's, and he said, as a favor to the president, let's not be too angry about this. Let's discuss this as a serious policy. Let's not call it communism or socialism, hearing Wicks, Whitaker and Baxter in the background. And it, immediately, Robert Taft, the senior Republican on the committee, gets up and says, not only am I going to call this socialism, I'm going to tell you this is the most socialist legislation uh, we have ever had in this Senate. And Murray gets up and says, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to throw you out. And the two literally get into a fight. Uh, he, Murray finally says, shut up and get out. I guess, you know, cutting right to, the, right to the essence of the thing. And Taft says, gladly. And out he walks and all the Republicans with him. And that's the end of Truman's national health insurance in the Senate committee. The House was easier. Clarence Lees was the head of the House committee. He decided, I'm not going to hold hearings on this thing. He just pocketed the bill and walked away. Nothing happens. So lots of battles, um, but Congress wasn't going to pass the thing anyway. Truman is an anomaly in this case. Strange. He refuses to argue for his national health insurance bill. He puts it on the table, and then he lets it be. The liberals are begging him, please go out, argue for this thing. And Truman won't. No one can quite figure out why. Maybe because it's just new to have such a big public battle over something. It's the beginning of the Cold War. Maybe he thinks he's the leader of the free world. He shouldn't be in a fight. We don't know. In the 1948 campaign, he rediscovers or discovers his voice. He becomes an awfully good public speaker. He stops giving speeches. They just give him bullet points, and he really pounds the table, pounds his opponents. The first really negative campaign in a long time. He was great. And national health insurance is a big issue. That do-nothing Congress won't even have hearings on my bill. But once he brings it back after winning the unexpected election in 1948, again, nothing. Congress isn't interested. But Truman does something interesting. After he's president, when he's ex-president, he decides this was the great defeat of his career. He writes in his autobiography, I've had many losses, but nothing that affected me as personally as the loss of national health insurance. And ironically, ex-president Truman becomes a ferocious advocate for this thing. He keeps it alive in a way that President Truman never did. Two legacies 
of this great battle over national health insurance in the Truman years, and they'll both echo through time. Legacy number one is the terms of the debate. To the left, this defines a good society. Everybody ought to have health care. It's a community vision. Oh, no, imagine that community is up there. It's a community ideal. It's a right. And the idea that people don't have health care is wrong. And Truman, the patron saint. It becomes the defining issue for Democrats. And if you look across time, there's no issue in public opinion polls where the Democrats have a larger advantage than Republicans. For Republicans, this becomes a ferocious attack, as it was originally, on the meaning of America itself. This is where you have to draw the line on the welfare state. And at stake, as I say, as I say is really the idea of the United States as a market society. And it's not about right. It's about a good that's a market good being taken out of the market, and in doing so, making America less American, making it, in more recent rhetorical terms, European. And for Republicans, the rhetoric has remained both fierce and, well, brilliant. Let me give you just one example of the rhetorical tone. Looking forward to 1963, in 1963, one of my favorite pieces of rhetoric, Medicare was about to pass in 63. I'm just uh, illustrating the rhetorical tone on the Republican side. Medicare are about to pass, and the AMA sends a record out to every physician saying, uh, bring in your friends, drink coffee, and then write letters to Congress saying this is a horrible piece of legislation. I want you to just listen to the tone that the record, they hired an actor, that the, the record took. Write those letters now. Call your friends. Tell them to write. If you don't, I promise you, this program will pass just as surely as the sun will come up tomorrow. And behind it will come other programs, other federal programs, that will invade every area of freedom as we have known it in this country, till one day we will wake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do this, write letters to Congress. One of these days we will awake to, well, one of these days we will sit and tell our children and our children's children what it was like in America when men were free. Medicare. Very persuasive rhetoric, and the, the man who cut the record, the actor, was one Ronald Reagan, who later had a career in politics. So there's the tone. Democrats, it's a right. If Republicans, no, it's a market good. But Having said that, so that's the first um, legacy, and both sides take that rhetorical tone. Second, irony on irony. I've said that no president can duck health care, and here's the biggest irony. Republicans are more successful at health care. Let's take the irony for Republicans and for Democrats. The irony for Republicans is that Republican presidents have been particularly successful at passing health care legislation and proposing new ideas about health care. Eisenhower puts the idea of uh, a tax subsidy for employer insurance, he puts it into the system. It was, it was already around since World War II, but he really systematizes it and builds, sort of sets the foundation for the contemporary employment-based health care system. He had some other plans that he thought would use the private system through uh, a federal reinsurance program to stop Medicare and later Medicaid. Nixon, probably the most inventive healthcare politics president uh, in the 20th century ever, uh, discovers HMOs and makes them a policy issue, the father of managed care and managed competition. Uh, all modern national health insurance uh, bills that the Democrats have proposed are really sons and grandsons or uh, daughters and granddaughters of the original Nixon plan. He said, forget the Truman plan. That's not going to work. You can't socialize the whole thing. We'll have employer-based and we'll have this patchwork system. And all Democrats have followed Nixon since then. Ronald Reagan, the same Ronald Reagan, what it was like in America when, when men were free, takes Medicare and makes the largest expansion of Medicare on the catastroph uh, with catastrophic care. Now, that doesn't last long. The Bush administration repeals it, and Congress repeals it after a year. But just the idea that Ronald Reagan would expand Medicare more than anybody before him. And if you look at his diaries, he's all over health care. Wish I could do something, he says, after catastrophic passes. Wish I could do something for the working stiff. 
you're reading his diary, you're thinking, Ron, what's up? What, pass health care for the working stiff? No, Reagan. Bush, Papa Bush, hated it. When, when there were meetings on health care, he'd talk sports until the meeting was over. He wanted nothing to do with it. But by the end of his administration, his people have come up with very creative ideas that were still in the mix for health insurance. And he, in fact, proposes national health insurance before the end of his first term, his, his, his one term. And uh, W uh, has, of course, the prescription drug plan, which is, the, again, the largest expansion of Medicare. It's half the size of the Obama health reform. So quite a litany of creative thought and success among Republicans, as an irony. They never get credit for it. Bush thought he's stealing the issue from the Democrats. 31 point difference by the time he runs for re-election. Who do you trust on health care? The Bush people are pulling their hair, out, their hair out. We gave them prescription drugs, and they're still not giving us credit. Democrats, on the other side, four very serious runs at all-out national health insurance, or a major part thereof. Truman, Johnson, Clinton, and Obama. Four serious runs, and I'll just point out what happens in the next midterms after each of those four. Lead, reading Truman to Obama, the Republicans win 56, 47, 54, and 63 seats in the House in the next election, the four largest swings since 1930. I'm not saying it's a causal story. I'm just saying if you're a Democrat and you go for NHI, be ready to duck. So here we have kind of the legacies for the parties. On the one hand, the rhetorical tone on either side set right back in the Truman era, and it barely changes. And beneath the rhetorical arguments, really quite a lot of creative thinking from Republicans. And the question, why is it? Why is it that every Republican administration is pushed or pushes itself to try to reform health care in a substantial way? Not the usual cliche, at a minimum. And for Democrats, very serious efforts. Uh, Carter is the only one who doesn't really try. Um, and you know, he proposes it, but he's, he's against it, really. Uh, he's just doing it to try to keep Kennedy quiet. Um, and yet, a lot of trouble for Democrats with this issue that's their signature issue. OK, that's the big picture of the parties. Let's get to the dirty, rotten secrets. I'm going to give you five or six lessons. I want to linger on the first one and then quickly give you a number of lessons, things that you see again and again when you watch the battles over national health insurance over time. Lesson number one, political scientists hate talking about leadership. We like institutions and systems, but individuals, you can go to a political science conference, political scientists here will be chuckling, you can go to a political science conference and never hear a name spoken. Uh, one of the critics of my first book wrote, Marone writes a book on 250 years of American history and thinks people didn't have anything to do with it. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's how we think. So I want to bring in how important leadership is. And it's important because our institutions are so difficult to run. Let's stick with Congress just for a second. Congress is the most infernal, exasperating, complicated, difficult legislative body in the universe, and maybe beyond. Let's, um, let's just look at, um, at the Obama health reform as it passed through Congress for a sense of the process. You ready? OK. In the House, which is the easy branch, three different committees write uh, uh, declare authority over the, uh, over the program and, um, and, and, and write pieces of legislation. They actually come up with two separate bills. And so the uh, speaker has to take these two different bills and turn them into one bill. So what the speaker does, Nancy Pelosi, is she goes to each group in the House, the Blue Dog Democrats, the Progressive Caucus, the people who are against abortion, the people who are for abortion, the Hispanic Caucus, the Black Caucus, and the list goes on. And she says, can you live with this? Can you live with that? Can you live with this? Can you live with that? No, this has to be in. OK, this goes in. That, that can't go in. That goes out. So she rewrites it. We now have the third piece of legislation. It then goes to the Rules Committee. If you're not a fan of Congress, you may not know that every piece of legislation that makes it to the floor comes with its own rules attached. What do the rules say? Whatever the majority can get away with. How long do you get to speak? May there be amendments? Blah, blah, blah. All those uh, different rules for each um, for, for, for each bill. 
they finally have a vote and the majority wins and the easy house is dispensed with. Then comes the Senate. Two more committees, they write very different bills. Then the majority leader goes not to each group, but to each individual because he has to get to 60, 60 being the number out of 100 required to beat a filibuster. And the majority goes to each, the majority leader goes to each individual, says, can you live with this? Can you live with that? Out goes that, in goes this. Every now and then, and then an indiv a, a individual senator goes and meet the press and announces that he can't possibly support this or that, and out it goes. Joe Lieberman was particularly delightful in this particular way. I can't live with a public option. There goes the public option. There are 60 Democrats. Um, it's going to require all 60 of them. That means every one of them, a little prince, can decide exactly what can stay in or stay out. It's a remarkable way uh, to do business. And so eventually you get the 60 votes cobbled together that can get around the, 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 the filibuster. And the thing goes to the floor of the Senate. Notice. Uh, I've been going through this quickly, but this is the seventh different piece of legislation that is being debated, um, and they vote on it. Harry Reid is so tired, it's 5.30 in the, in the morning, on a Sunday morning, Harry Reid is so tired that he actually votes against it, and with everybody laughing, he changes his vote. <laughs> now we've got two different pieces of legislation, one for the House, one that they don't even have the same name. So they go to conference committee where they do all the fine tuning, but at that moment, Ted Kennedy's seat goes to a Republican, Scott Brown, who shocks the political establishment, and he had a great campaign theme, I'm stopping Obamacare. Now we have two bills, but there's three more filibuster opportunities in the Senate, so it can't go, can't go that way. And so then we go to extraordinary measures to get this thing passed. It is a remarkable way to pass any piece of legislation. Um, the answer any time someone comes up to you, someone comes down from Canada and says, oh, I don't understand your political system. What explains this? And you have no idea what the answer is. I can tell you what the answer is. The answer is, oh, it's the way we designed the Senate. That's, that's why it's like that. And forget everything else. That's, that's the explanation. I remember talking to a, a, a staffer uh, as this thing was going through. And, um, and I kept saying, well, so, what, so what's the delay here? And the staffer, excuse me, I'm just going to quote him directly, and I apologize because it's a little bit off color, but hey, we're in Montana. You guys are good with this, right? Um, so every time uh, I say, well, so what's going on? He just says, he just, yeah, I can hear him shaking his head on the phone. He goes, fucking Ben Nelson, fucking Ben Nelson. <laughs> ben Nelson was the 60th vote. He's in a very Republican state. He, <laughs> He, he knows this vote is going to be really hard on him. So he keeps saying, I can't have that. I can't have that. I can't have that. Turns out Ben Nelson was right about a lot of stuff. But boy, he caused the Democrats fit, fits. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is simple. It takes extraordinary skill to get anything, much less something this big, through Congress. Extraordinary skill. The great, great lesson for this, the great exemplar, the avatar of skill was Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was the master of the Senate, and he knew how to run this stuff. I did give you a couple of examples. In this book we wrote, um, The Heart of Power, we go through each presidency, and uh, we listen to the tapes that Lyndon, about Lyndon Johnson, extraordinary stories. One famous story, Medicare, Johnson's trying to get Medicare. It's, um, it's the end of 1964, Medicare hasn't passed, but there's a Social Security bill on the table. And the opponents of Social Security in committee, so they've already passed both House and Senate, decides they can, kill, they can kill Medicare by raising the taxes on Social giving the benefits so high on Social Security, raise the taxes so high, there's no way, there's no room for Medicare in the next Congress. So the opponents of Medicare figure, we'll expand Social Security so big, there's no room for this thing. And um, it looks like they're going to win. And at the very last minute, two senators, Smathers of, of Florida and Long of uh, Louisiana, um, both changed their vote at the last minute. And, um, and the reporters are skeptical. There have been, there have been opponents of Medicare, and yet at the last minute, they vote down a Social Security increase to save room for Medicare. One reporter asked Smathers, uh, they asked both of them actually, Why, why'd you do that? And uh, Smathers had the great answer, Lyndon told us to. Lyndon told us to. <laughs> and so we, we read this, we think, why? So we go to the tapes, listening to the tapes, and about three weeks after this, four weeks after this, Long calls Lyndon. Lyndon's eating lunch. You can hear him rock tea. You can hear him eating lunch at this table. These are the tapes that got Nixon in so much trouble. Johnson got away with them. So 
Um, Long goes, oh, Mr. President, they're going to close the largest base in my state. No, it was a big air base. If McNamara wants to close it, you've got to help me. Johnson is completely, he's not very nice. He goes, I'm sorry, Senator. If it's on McNamara's list, McNamara's the Secretary of Defense. Nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. Sorry, Senator. And uh, Long pleads a little bit. Nah, there's nothing I can do. It's McNamara. I can't touch that. This is a long pause. And then Long says, Mr. President, when you needed that vote on Medicare, I didn't go back on you. Johnson stops eating. He goes, call you back. He calls over to the, uh, to the Pentagon. Uh, McNamara's not there, but Clark Clifford is. And he says, uh, you, you're going to close a base in, uh, you're gonna, we're going to close one of Senator Long's bases? And Clifford doesn't even look it up. He goes, oh, no, no, no. Long is the head of the committee. He's the chair of the committee. We'd never close a base. Uh, and Johnson says, what you just said, never say to anybody else. You got me? Well, yes, sir, Mr. President. He then calls Long back. Johnson does. And he says, Mr. Senator, I've made some inquiry. You've got nothing to worry about. Long is jubilant. He thinks Johnson just squelched it. And he says, oh, Mr. Boss Man, you're my boss man. You've got my vote any time. And Johnson says, well, I'm sure they wanted to close it anyhow. Oh, you're my boss. Oh, you just remember who your boss man is. Yeah, you're my boss. And he hangs up. Well, that's someone who knows how to run the system, right? Um, I'm not saying this is the way you want your government to run, but if it runs that way, you've got to admire Johnson. I'll tell you one more Johnson story, and then I'll stop. The usual story about how Medicare passes goes like this. Democrats are fighting for it, but not the Southern Democrats. And Wilbur Mills, the head of the Ways and Means Committee, single-handedly blocks it. He doesn't let it out of the Ways and Means Committee. So even though it's got a majority in Congress, it's not getting out of Ways and Means, Wilbur Mills isn't going to let it, because Wilbur Mills thinks it's a bad program, because Wilbur Mills is worried about fiscal sanity. And so he says, no, no, no. And then after the 19, Kennedy's assassinated in 63, after the 64 landslide, um, uh, it's too many Democrats. There are Democrats everywhere. And Wilbur Mills feels, figures, OK, this thing is going to pass. I may as well lead the charge. He takes the, med the administration Medicare program, which is health care in hospitals for people over 65. He takes a second program that was designed to block it, a second proposal, um, which was health care for doctor's bills, which the AMA was supporting. And he takes a third proposal, which was also meant to block, which is health care for poor people. Not all elderly, because some of them are wealthy, just poor people. And Wilbur Mills says, let's pass all three. Why don't we have Medicare Part A, Medicare Part B, and I don't know, third one we'll call Medicaid. Pass all three. Democrats are like, what's he up to? They go running to Johnson, and they say to Johnson, what do we do? And Johnson says, I'll give him the money. I, I, I'm going to go call my brother. And, and, and Call your brother. This isn't Johnson's autobiography. Call your brother. Why, why, why are you going to call your brother? You don't know that story? Every Texan knows that story. See, there's a fella. He wants to run the rails. And they take him to the switch, and they give him the IQ test. Train going north 50 miles an hour. Train going south 30 miles an hour. Here's the switch. What do you do? The fellow says, I go call my brother. That's not the right answer. Why do you go call my brother? And the fellow smiles and says, I ain't never seen no train that been wrecked before, and neither is he. Give Wilbur the money, we'll work it out. <laughs> so that's the story. And Johnson writes his autobiography, Wilbur Mills went from the villain to the hero for the old folks. Then we got the tapes. They were just released three or four years ago. So we, we, were, we were the first ones in. What happens? Johnson calls Wilbur Mills as soon as Kennedy's assassination. It's two weeks after the assassination. And you hear him on the phone. He says, Wilbur, I need Medicare. Wilbur, I need Medicare bad. Wilbur says, Mr. President, I can't pass Medicare. I've been opposing it all my life. Johnson says, Wilbur, tell him it wasn't good enough. Wilbur, make it your own. Make it big. Say it wasn't good enough. And Wilbur resists at first, but Johnson keeps working him. He calls him again. Once he gets him walking onto the floor of the house, and he says, how's the Mills bill? He goes, Wilbur, this will make you famous. Wilbur, you'll get all the credit. Wilbur, you could be vice president. So Johnson was in it from the start. But the master of the Senate and master of the House knew, give him all the credit. You don't need to take credit. It wasn't a 40 years later when the tapes became clear that we understood it was at least partially Johnson's idea to do this triple passage of Medicare. So the first thing to say right across history is if you're going to work any big bill, any large piece of legislation, but it's true for health care every time, Learn to work the machine, because man, it's a difficult machine to work. Let me run through a few other lessons quickly. And I know there's a lot of other people to speak, and I don't want to take all your 
take all your time and air. Lesson number two, remember the symbols. This is about symbols. Opponents figured this out in the 1940s, as I've said, the familiar linen. This is the most socialistic bill before this House, before this Senate. This is communism. It's un-America. It's bureaucracy run amok. It's big government. It's Harry and Louise. The Ronald Reagan rhetoric I've already given you. In this long legacy, I think standing in this pantheon has to be Sarah Palin's brilliant tweet, death panels. What a, what a superlative way to summarize in a second in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a phrase, the fear of government-run health care. Um, even Chuck Grassley, who had, uh, who had been negotiating on the Senate Finance Committee uh, with Max Baucus, negotiating, 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 goes home to a town meeting, has people scream at him, and goes to the press and says, I would worry about death panels for, for your grandmother. Um, Democrats are like, what? We were negotiating with you. Um, but that was the spirit powerful image that captured the opposition. On the other side, remember Truman never mounted a defense of national health insurance. And incredibly enough, Democrats have always been remarkably maladroit. Obama was really quite good at getting this through Congress, but so inarticulate about finding his own counter set of symbols. The Democratic answer in the Truman era, they took out full page ads. Here, here's how it ran. Powerful symbol for the Truman era. The Democrat has said his national health insurance program is not socialism. That'll get you going, right? Socialism, no it's not. <laughs> death panels, death panels. No, there's no death panels, but all right, we'll repeal that, 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 that piece of the legislation. Um, an alternate symbol, any symbol, has to have four pieces. There's a problem. I've got a solution. There's an innocent victim, children, mothers, someone, and there's a villain. Obama couldn't bring him. He'd cut a deal with the insurance industry. Now how can he call them villains? So he just couldn't. Then Scott Brown wins this election, and the Democrats run for cover. And they say to Obama, unless you move the needle on this thing, it's over. And suddenly Obama gets the rhetorical debate. There's villains. There's innocent victims, these children, my mother uh, herself, these people dying. So gets it exactly right for, uh, in terms of symbols for just a little while. Crisp, clear, sustained, standing next to villains, and then drops it all over again. The Obama administration people just didn't have the stomach for this symbolic debate, which involves taking, well, how to put it. There's a bumper sticker I saw once in Washington uh, that goes like this. Um, if you have to explain, you've lost the debate. If you can't fit it on a bunker sticker, you've lost the debate. Um, and that has proven very difficult for people who are in the policy weeds debating. But the basic story is simple. This debate, as it runs public, is a debate about symbols, about, about big pictures that may, can, in a sentence, get people to understand. Um, the great symbol for the Republicans has been socialism, meaning this is too much government for the American regime. The great symbol for the Democrats often are articulated is this is about simple justice. Um, but symbols can be misleading because they're symbols. They stand for much larger arguments. Um, and they are so much a part of the health care debate. Uh, the, the, the cost of the Democrats not getting the symbolic uh, story right is clear afterwards. So first the court decision, then an election, and now still winning this debate still requires state action, as you so well know here, in state after state, having a very hard time with it because never able to convince the public that this legislation is doing something useful for them. Congress, lesson number one. Lesson number two, get the symbols right. That is, let me put this more precisely, reduce your argument into a way that people can understand. And I think the Republicans in this round did a brilliant job. And the Democrats, except for one month, never quite showed up. A remarkable thing to have your signature issue ignored when you run for re-election. Now to a Republican, easy pickings. You have a crummy bill. Of course you wouldn't run away from it. Democrats never managed to articulate their response for their signature issue since Franklin Roosevelt. What's the response? Couldn't put it in symbolic terms. 
If this seems awfully petty for you, oh God, these political scientists, Congress is this horrible institution, and now, and now symbols with bumper stickers. When are we going to get to something deeper? Lesson number three is get your philosophy straight. The United States has always gone between two great philosophies, and they're the themes of this program. One philosophy, I'll talk about this more tonight, but let me just briefly state it here. One philosophy is the philosophy of com communitarianism. We're all in this together. These dark times will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true purpose is to minister to our fellow man. It's Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural address. That's the great statement of communitarianism, a deeper philosophy. On the other side, Ronald Reagan. You know, government is not the solution to our problems. We're a market individual society. And Reagan uh, achieved sneers when he first said it in the inaugural campaign for much of the political spectrum. But he said it, and he said it, and he said it. And he's a great president because he made it stick. And we've lived ever since in the age of Reagan in the sense that the default position is the position not of Roosevelt, which was the default position between 1932 and 1980, but the Reagan position, which has been the default position from 1980 to now. Uh, Obama was no exception through his first term. He lived in a world still defined by Reagan's first inaugural. What's been striking about the second term is that he has tried this time to reset the clock, to say, no, I'm going to go back to a communitarian ideal. I'll talk more about this tonight. But it seems to me Obama is trying a rhetorical move that states a philosophy. And again, many people responding exactly the way people originally responded to Reagan. What are you doing? What is this, this pure political partisanship? It's more than that, I think. It's an effort to restate the, the state of America's great dialectic between individualism and communitarianism. Let me leave that for now, and we'll come back to it tonight. But for now, let me just say that presidents have to state a philosophy in which their public policies operate, in which the symbols operate. And a failure to do that makes it very hard to defend your positions. Work the machine, mine the symbols, get your philosophy straight. Four, passion. Why would any president try something that's this difficult? We had a hypothesis going into our book, and that was this. Presidents are a very sickly bunch. It's amazing how bad their health care is. They're more interested in secrecy than they are in getting good health care. So you don't want to follow. Find out the president's doctor and stay away. Um, they, as a rule, die young. Ken and one after another, Kennedy gets the last rites of the Catholic Church four times as an adult. His father, a wonderful scene a few years before he's uh, uh, president, his father weeping in his hospital room while Kennedy's getting the last rites of the church. So we figure, you know, Johnson has this massive heart attack. I can't resist. One last Johnson story. Johnson lying in bed trying to figure out what's going on. He says to his wife, Lady Bird, he says, what, what, what are my chances? He says, oh, you're, you're fine, Lyndon. Lyndon says to Lady Bird, I heard the doctor talking. They said, my chances are 1 in 10. And Lady Bird says, Lyndon, that's not true. They're saying 50-50. And Johnson smiles. OK, thank you. I was trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> even with his wife, he never stops. But these are sick people, so we have a hypothesis. They understand health care. Homelessness, they're not going to get, right? Prison reform, most of them haven't been in jail. But health care, they're all sickly. No, wrong. Never was a hypothesis more refuted. They, they're tough. <coughs> Excuse me. So Kennedy is going to prove that he is healthy despite the fact that he is a sickly guy. But they're babies over one thing. When someone they love gets sick, they, they collapse. Kennedy, who nothing slows him down. He's, get, he's got 30 drugs a day he's taking. But he's tough. When his father has a stroke, all he wants to talk about is Medicare. Medicare goes from the bottom of his list. He doesn't really care about it. His father has a stroke, and he starts giving speeches. He starts haranguing his advisors, where's Medicare? I need Medicare because of his dad. That's what gives the president's passion over health care, one after another. Eisenhower didn't much care until Mamie's uh, mother, his wife's mother, uh, has a heart attack all of a sudden. This is a guy who had two heart attacks and a stroke in the White House. He doesn't care about himself. But Mamie's mother changes everything for him. 
So the fourth thing to watch for with presidents is do they have the fire in the belly about this very difficult issue? And they have it when they watch someone they love get sick or die. Work Congress, mind the symbols, get your philosophy straight, feel the passion. Fifth, probably the most important rule of all, speed. President loses political capital every day. Again, Johnson was great about this. He gets a group together. He says, we just won the biggest landslide in history. Every day, someone's going to kick me. Every day, I'm going to lose some political capital. He was right. By the end of the, by the, two years later, he's lost his political capital. So he wants to cram things through as quickly as possible. This is the great, why did Clinton's reform in 1993-4 lose and Obama's win? You can have lots of reasons, but the crucial reason is the clock. Clinton waited till January of his second year before he got that thing before Congress. That time in Obama terms, that's the same. It's a, it's a little bit before Scott Brown wins the election. He waited too long, uh, Clinton did. Obama understood that, and he just pushed this through very quickly. Jeremy, who's going to talk uh, soon, really has a, a, a nice account of the difference between Clinton and Obama. But the punchline of this lesson is simple. The savvy health advisor turns to her president-elect the day after the election and says, hurry up, Mr. President, on health care, you're almost out of time. Speed, speed, speed. Lesson six in my favorite, tell the economists to shut up. We've gotten into some trouble with this one. Uh, but Every single president, no exception, says, I want to do health care. The economists trooped into the room, shake their heads, and say, no, Mr. President, you can't do this. Uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, the, the economists are taking a short-term view, of course, that's their job, of, uh, of the finances, and they say, you can't do it. From Ike, where the Bureau of the Budget, he wants to spend this tiny little bit of money on health care, and the Bureau of the Budget is writing these long memos about how it'll disrupt the entire economy. Uh, JFK, LBJ, L JFK and LBJ, they just took the estimates, and they, they cut them in half. Uh, LBJ, we've got a phone call to him talking to Ted Kennedy, just elected. He says, don't let them ask them. Don't let them cost out your proposals. He says, those guys want to cost out, cost out Medicare five years down the line. I'm losing votes like crazy because they say it's going to cost a billion. Medicare would not have passed if we had had good cost estimates. A remarkable thing. He lied. Um, now, it's, now you can't lie. Uh, OMB and CBO are there, they're costing things out. But it's still a complicated game. As Rob has a marvelous paper on this, it really illustrates this. So now there's different, so it's only 10 years. So you cost it out 10 years, whatever happens in year 11 doesn't matter. Okay, get a bunch of Democratic and Republican economists in the room and let them play with that. They're gonna cost it out, but after 10 years, that's the, that's the whole window. Every president basically has to say to the economists, I'm putting you guys aside. Bush, George Bush, George, uh, w. Bush got this exactly right. Uh, after everybody told him why he shouldn't do uh, prescription drugs, he said, this is how much I'm spending, and that's it. And um, uh, it, it was actually, by Republican standards, a lot of money, and a lot of Republicans are still annoyed at him. But in terms, for a political scientist, we admire the way he said, this is what I'm spending, you guys, off to the side. Hush the economists. Uh, if you want to pass health care, you're going to have to do that because the economists will come in and jolt you. Uh, same thing with Obama. Oh, Larry Summers was going crazy. Um, we don't we do something else. Let's worry about the economy. Obama, no, I'm going to do this. Um, finally, and a very important lesson, learn to lose. Uh, I could go through each president, but most presidents will lose their health care debates. And the most important thing you do for future politics is what you do with your defeat. And Harry Truman, go back to him, is the exemplar. He lost and he did a terrible job with health insurance. He didn't help the cause at all. But once he lost, interestingly enough, he made it the cause of his campaign. He kept on fighting. When Johnson passes Medicare 10 years later, 12 years later, 12 years after the Truman administration, he says, we're going to sign this thing in front of Harry. Harry's now in his 80s. So they're going to fly out. And Johnson's advisors are, oh, Mr. President, that's going to look like socialism, because everybody remembers that was socialized medicine. It's only going to say that the critics were right. Johnson says, no, we're signing this in front of Harry. And if you're a liberal, this is the high point of the 20th century for you, um, that Johnson and Truman sitting side by side, these great icons of liberalism, and Johnson turns to Truman, and he says, only you, Mr. President, only you can understand what I'm feeling now. 
and he signs the bill and, and hands Harry Truman Medicare card number one. And Harry holds it up and says, this is the proudest moment of my life. And there's Bess Truman standing right behind him, and you wonder what was going through her mind as he says that. <laughs> Learn to run Congress. Mind the symbols. Get your philosophy straight. That's for if you don't like symbols. Passion is crucial. Speed, hush the economists, and learn to lose. Now, I said learn to lose when we wrote this book. It never occurred to me, Obama administration, that we ought to have told them, learn to win as well. The rhetoric that comes out of the administration is going to be crucial for future politics. Well, look, I'm almost out of time. Let me just very briefly and in conclusion tell you something, uh, because I'll lose my political science card if I don't, tell you something about where we are and what's different about our politics today. I'll just take two minutes, and then we'll make way for everybody else, if I've got two minutes. Um, there's two views of what's going on now uh, among Democrats. One is, yeah, the politics is loud, but slowly but surely, national health, uh, the Obamacare is being implemented. Uh, slow, steady progress. Christy today uh, of, of, of New Jersey goes along. Scott of Florida goes along. This is a, governors are problem solving, and it's going forward. The other view is this is still up for political grabs. If you live in the South, it's not just going along. And indeed, in the Mountain West, too, the debate continues. So where are we in national politics? Here's where we are, I think. What's unusual about the ferocious tone in Washington is this, I think. We've come to a place where it's hard to find closure in the Washington political scene. It used to be after a vote, the debate was over. You know, most robots, um, again, I'm quoting Jeremy Johnson here, but uh, one Democrat, one Republican voted for Social Security on the original vote. A one, a Livingston of New York. Uh, thank you. Um, but once it's through, that's it. Everybody goes over and votes for it. Likewise, Medicare, 10 votes for. Um, but they all switch. Even the Civil Rights Act, the most bitterly contested piece of legislation, I think, in the 20th century. Um, once the vote is over, the vote is over. Uh, the filibuster took 67 votes back then to break a filibuster. But once it's broken, no, now no longer. Here, how many years after the original passage of the bill, the, uh, the House is still voting to repeal Obamacare. I don't know of a piece of legislation that has lived that long in Congress. That's Congress. I haven't talked about the courts. That's a separate lecture. But the courts, there was a polite fiction. Political scientists didn't believe it, but it's still a polite fiction. The courts rule on the basis of law. We have lots of studies that show it's not really true. They vote on the basis of ideology, but keep it quiet, OK? But now the public has gotten the message, uh, ever since the Bork hearings, again, another story, that the court views. So two-thirds of the public, 70% of the public, expects the court to vote on the basis of their ideology, not on the basis of the law, which means the courts don't bring closure. It's just another political vote. So what we've got is a political system that doesn't seem to have closure in any branch. And that's unusual. In fact. I think that's really uh, new in politics, at least since the 19th century. So the question is, why? Why do they fight so ferociously, and why do they not have closure? And I think the answer is clear. The answer is simple, and that's this. Both sides think they can win the next election, and that's unusual in American politics. In the last 32 years, the Democrats have controlled at least one House of Congress for 21.5. Jeffords switch, that's why the 5.5. The Republicans for 20.5. That's close. Let's do some comparisons. The previous 32 years, Democrats, 30 to 2. Republicans had at least one whole uh, uh, House of Congress for two years. Go back to the previous 16 years, Republicans, 14. Democrats, 2. Two years. Well, when one party is clearly in the, other, in the majority, the other party defers because they're, worried, they're running for their lives. If both parties have a real good, that's not English, I know, but sorry, a real good chance of winning the next election, there is no incentive to cooperate. This deadlock ends when one party finally breaks through, as has always happened in American politics, and takes over. So that's what we're waiting for. Six, uh, eight years ago, we thought it was the Republicans breaking through after uh, George Bush won re-election. Now everybody's talking about the Democrats breaking through. They've got the young people. They've got Latinos um, and Republicans quickly scrambling to make sure that doesn't happen. But for the last 30 years, we've really had very close elections. This is a very, very long period.
to have it this contested. In fact, it hasn't existed in the 20th century uh, before the 1990s, elections this close. One final point, the tone is so ferocious. My sense is that with elections this close this long, the tone has just gotten more and more fierce. I remember in the early 90s, a congressman from Rhode Island, I was having lunch with him, and he told me that he loved playing basketball with a bunch of guys, because it's lonely down in Congress, because his family's back in Rhode Island, and we're down in Washington. He said, lonely here. Uh, and the leadership comes to him and says, you're playing basketball with Democrats, no more than the enemy. Unheard of. And he finally just dropped out. He didn't want any more to do with it. And the Democrats respond in kind. And so the idea of at 5 o'clock we drink together and play basketball together, that disappears in the 1990s. Now, that's not entirely new. If you were around in the 1960s and one party was the party of segregation, uh, one group was the group of segregation, you didn't like those people very much if you were an integrationist. But that gets added on to a couple of new features. One, ideology. Democrats used to run the span from very conservative to very liberal, and likewise Republicans. Now that's changed. The most, liberal, the most conservative Democrat in the Congress is now far more liberal than the most liberal Republican. For the first time since the Civil War, the parties equal ideology. And that's new. That's new since the Civil War. So no more overlap. And secondly, these guys don't know each other anymore. They used to live in Washington, play basketball, drink together. Now they fly in Tuesday morning. They do business till Thursday afternoon. And then they fly back home because they're worried about a primary cha challenge. So here's the context for health reform, for any politics. There's no closure in our institutions anymore. There's very high partisanship because of close elections. There's fierce opposition. They're the enemy. Don't play with them. And it's a government of strangers. Is this terrible, or is this just American politics as usual? Well, I'll leave it to the discussants to sort that difficult question out. But I'll just give you my view. And that's the view that Churchill so famously articulated. Count on the Americans to do the right thing, said Churchill after they've exhausted every other possibility. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Jim, for that um, incredible overview of the last 100 years of healthcare in America. Um, Jeremy, I want to turn to you first. You study this stuff as well. What's, uh, what's your reaction to Jim's talk? I have two general themes um, I was thinking about when I was listening to Jim's talk. I'll amplify a few of his points on national health insurance. I'll just extend a bit to Medicare. I'll turn over the baton then. Theme number one, I'm a little more cynical than Jim. Uh, I think there's uh, quite a bit of partisanship, triumph of partisanship over policy ideas, both good and bad policy ideas, partisan triumphs over all of it, partisanship at the moment. Second. Don't take anything politicians say seriously at all on issues about health care. Not at all. Essentially, um, since the 1970s, they've all, both Democrats and Republicans, um, have one answer, more market mechanisms. Sometimes market mechanisms are good. Often they do not work well. Uh, how, and uh, we'll see, of course, that uh, one person's market mechanisms is another person's socialized medicine. Okay, so let's just talk about NHI just a little bit. Um, as Jim said, Nixon, uh, you know, he's sort of tired of Ted Kennedy and all this stuff about single-payer health care. So Nixon comes up with this idea. He wants a conservative response to uh, uh, Nixon. And so, you know, they, they finally come up with this thing, you know, HMOs. We didn't know what HMOs were back then. And then this idea of an employer mandate. An em employer should offer health insurance. Instead of having a single-payer, this huge government expansion, that is Nixon, that's essentially Nixon's uh, a response. Liberals in Congress were part and parcel of helping to destroy the, a, a Nixon National Health Insurance from passing, although the HMO Act of 1973 did pass, and HMOs were on the map, but not NHI. All right, um, we'll skip over to 1991. People are not thinking a whole lot about NHI. We have a Republican president, George H.W. Bush. A certain senator from Pennsylvania, John Hines, tragically dies in a helicopter crash. And uh, uh, everybody knows that Dick Thornburg, who's the Attorney General of the United States, two-term governor of Pennsylvania, is going to win that Senate seat in a special election. A Democratic governor of Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Governor Casey, the father of the current senator, needs to appoint somebody 
to watch over the seat before Thornburg trounces him or her in the next election. Well, there's an old, there's a elderly gentleman, former president of Bryn Mawr College named Harris Walford, 65 years old, civil rights leader from the 1960s. Nobody in Pennsylvania outside Bryn Mawr really knows who he is. He's made senator. First poll, he's down against Thornburg by 44 points. Well, what should we, what should we do? He comes up with an idea. He has to convince his campaign consultants, uh, Carville and others. If, if, if criminals are, uh, have the right to an attorney, a lawyer, we should have a, a citizen should have a right to a doctor. He runs on that. Dick Thornburg basically does not give a response based off the advice of Phil Graham of Texas. Well, Walford narrows the polls. The issue works well. Now, the economy is going down when George H.W. Bush, who had a 91% approval rating just shortly before, Walford in a landslide beats uh, close to a landslide, beats Thornburg by 10 points, one of the biggest turnarounds of all time. The Scott Brown race years later is sort of the flip of that. So we have health insurance on the agenda. The 1992 Democratic candidates have to deal with it. Bill Clinton doesn't know really what to do. Tom Harkin, et cetera, have all these ideas. Then there's this idea, you know, managed care, et cetera, involving HMOs. This is the way to get to national health insurance by an employer mandate. That sounds an awful lot like the Nixon plan indeed. It was. All right, Clinton's elected. He's trying to get this through, Hillary Clinton's task force, et cetera. And uh, the Republicans want a response. They want a conservative response to this liberal employer mandate. So uh, Chafee Dole, um, a Senator Chafee of Rhode Island, Senator Dole of uh, Kansas, a Republican leader in the Senate, they come up with an idea called the individual mandate. There's other ideas from Republicans, such as health savings accounts out there. That's going to be the alternative to the Clinton plan. Well, Clinton's poll numbers go down, boom, the 1994 election. Democrats are swept out, including Harris Walford in Pennsylvania to Rick Santorum, narrowly to Rick Santorum. He lost by 87,210 votes. I remember that one. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, so we don't hear a whole lot about Nash NHI again until Obama. So um, Obama says, well, what should we do? Let's do an individual mandate. We have Republicans favoring this. Gingrich spoke out in favor in, in uh, 2005. Mitt Romney was in favor of it in Massachusetts. And on national television, he said that this might be a good model for the rest of the country to adopt. So Obama tries it. The, um, uh, the Republicans do not want this socialized medicine of the individual mandate. There's also the public option. That goes away because of Joe Lieberman. So they need all 60 votes. So we do know that Obama gets it through. In fact, at one point, he's arguing, even though Republicans aren't supporting it, we have all these Republican ideas in it, dot, 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 dot. Well, Basically, all of NHI, I'd argue, is more or less a big political triumph of partisanship. And people might have veins sticking out of their foreheads arguing about socialized medicine, et cetera, or this is the Demo you know, great democratic plan to get to NHI. Essentially, we should just think of this, I think, mainly in partisan terms and not so much in policy ideas that Jim, et cetera, like to think about in those terms, which is kind of depressing for a policy wonk, but it is what it is. Second point, second point. Don't take politicians' arguments seriously at all. Just very quickly on Medicare. Nixon, Richard Nixon. You know, Medicare costs a whole lot of money because of, you know, we talked about Johnson lying. So Nixon, what do we do about this? There's, there's this new treatment for ki uh, kidney end-stage renal disease. What do we do about this? We need to put them on Medicare. It works very well. That'll make it even more expensive. Nixon is very, very intelligent. He comes up with all these good ideas, essentially about how to get things through. He says, okay. We'll expand Medicare, uh, including end-stage renal patients, and we're also going to add market mechanisms to save money in the future, hopefully. He gets the first optional HMO program inserted into Medicare, even before the HMO Act is passed in 1973. All right, it doesn't work that well. People don't flock to it. It's not really, really like HMOs today. It's actually had better care than, than, than Medicare. As Nixon, et cetera, assumed that would actually work and uh, the reimbursement rates will be lower than Medicare, it said 95%. Very few people went into it. It declined and fell. But you know, the politician's conclusion was we need more market mechanisms, both Democrats and Republicans. A Democrat from Missouri, Dick Gephardt, and a Republican from Michigan, David Stockman, said, let's do vouchers. And they proposed the first voucher plan. It looks a whole lot like the Paul Ryan plan. It's not that different. The idea was once 60% of people got a voucher, they would get rid of Medicare. And then uh, Stockman is, is promoted, uh, Reagan's elected president to head of OMB. And, and Gephardt does not stop. He tries to get Bill Gray to send of Ohio. They, they, a watered down version. It gets through ways and means, but it's killed in a conference agreement between the House and the Senate. 
1983, all of a sudden, Gephardt, after all this vouchers to try to save money, switches. He becomes the biggest champion of Medicare that we basically have, the traditional Medicare program. All right. We'll so basically, um, there is another. Um, they try to reinvigorate the whole HMO Medicare program. And uh, Medicare risks, Reagan tries again. It kind of it fails again. It doesn't really work. Fast forward to 1994, the Gingrich Congress needs savings from Medicare. Again, market mechanisms are the way to do so, to better delivery of services. Medicare plus choice is eventually established in 1997. It includes uh, all sorts of managed care options, including uh, health savings accounts, uh, back then called medical savings accounts. Chairman of Ways and Means, Archer, says this is the way to go. We have an optional program, Medicare. They think seniors are going to flock to these medical savings accounts. It doesn't happen. They like traditional Medicare better. 2003, Medicare just keeps soaring in price. George W. Bush, there's a demand for a prescription drug benefit. Okay, let's dust off, let's dust off the Nixon formula. We expand, uh, we expand um, uh, with the prescription drug benefit. We add Medicare Advantage. The promise is that's going to save money with good health care. Tom Scully, who's in charge of, the, of Medicare services at the time, says um, uh, most people are going to go into PPOs, most seniors, because by then people hated HMOs. There was a big uh, Time Magazine article. Uh, this is a revolt against HMOs. Well, just um, so Medicare Advantage is sold that way. And, uh, and what's happened is, uh, by that point, um, the average reimbursement essentially for a uh, Medicare Advantage plan is actually more than per patient with Medicare. And it does become much more um, popular than any other previous plan, and more and more seniors are going on to various Medicare Advantage plans. They still are not going into health savings accounts, but they, and they're really going to our versions of HMOs, HMOs. The PPOs, there's not a whole lot of, there's some Medicare Advantage PPOs, but the majority are HMOs, not PPOs as advertised. So we're getting the private sector there. Now, of course, we still have too much being spent on Medicare. This is not saving money. So we now get to today. We know about Paul Ryan's voucher plan, dusting off the old uh, Dick Gephardt, David Stockman model. And I think we've seen the future, in, uh, just in the last week, about uh, how Republicans will, will talk about health care. Dr. Carson uh, from Johns Hopkins University was sitting right next to uh, the president at a prayer breakfast. He stood up, criticized the Affordable Care Act, and said health savings accounts are the way to go. I think you know a whole lot more about, probably know a whole lot more than Dr. Carson, but you weren't sitting next to Obama. So, uh, um, uh, so I think this will be the future argument. Again, I mean, I don't know exactly what you're going to say, so I, I, I don't mean to. Um, but again, um, I think what we're going to see here is that, again, health savings accounts sound very good in theory. However, the, um, because they're portable, and you do feel, you feel a bite as a consumer, so you hopefully have, um, will not just use excessive health care. Nonetheless, they're best for people who are rich and who don't need to go to the doctor. In other words, the people who least need health insurance. Essentially, if you're middle class, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars salaries, they're very high deductible plans. And, um, it's a, and the, the, um, often it's $3,000 or so for an individual, five, six thousand dollars you to pay 100% out of pocket before you hit catastrophic and get 100%, often 100% covered after that. That is um, a perverse incentive for uh, uh, people who um, um, might want to go to the doctor originally but to, to stop sort of a, a, a harsher, um, um, you know, a, a escalating um, sicknesses. I, I was hearing about a, a cancer patient. Her doctor threatened, threatened, I just drive you directly to, to get tested. You need a biopsy, and she did have cancer. Um, sometimes preventative care is sometimes covered. People often don't know that. Or at, um, we have that at Carroll College, a health savings account. A professor had a colonoscopy where they found a polyp, they removed it. He got dinged for the whole cost, and he didn't think he would. People tend to budget per month. And uh, it would work better if employers gave quite a bit uh, to your health savings account. Usually, it's a version of retrenchment. Employers give very little. So I don't, I, I don't think people, and also that you basically need everybody to, 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 to have a health savings account for it to work. Um, uh, hopefully, right now, very few people do, and it's often the people who struggle the most. My comments are done. That's my reaction to Jim's paper. Over Groy. <laughs> uh, I'll just make a couple of points. Um, first, I, I, thought, I thought Jim's talk was excellent, and I think that uh, it's, it's always very interesting to, to reflect upon the, the history and evolution of the American healthcare system. and. And, and, and learn from, and learn lessons from, from that evolution. Uh, I'd say that 
Uh, one thing I would take issue with in Jim's uh, discussion is we should actually listen to the economists a lot more than we do. Um, uh, and now, the economists don't all agree. There are liberal economists, there are conservative economists, but whichever set of economists you want to listen to, listen to some economists. Uh, if we look back on the Medicare uh, uh, debate, uh, the, the House Ways and Means Committee uh, estimated, and this was the official cost estimate that was used in the discussion and the debate about Medicare, they uh, estimated that in 1990, in inflation-adjusted dollars, Medicare, uh, the federal government would be spending $10 billion on Medicare. The actual figure was $110 billion. Today, we're, uh, we're on the verge of spending a trillion dollars a year on Medicare. And as Paul Starr, who's written uh, uh, the most famous history of the American healthcare system, has described, the passage of Medi Medicare was a policy trap I know that it's been described as the great triumph, the great moment, liberal moment of the 20th century. I would argue it's quite the opposite because what, and what Paul Starr has described, and, and I agree with him, is that that trillion dollars we spend on Medicare is money that we're not spending on health care for the poor, the lower income people. Medicaid, the program that was passed simultaneously with Medicare, is a much poorer program and, and resources, and, and it's inefficiently designed, it's inefficiently delivered, health outcomes for medication patients are very poor. If we had never passed Medicare, but only passed Medicaid, the Medicaid program would be a lot better and a lot stronger today. And we'd have better health outcomes and better health care for the poor, and arguably would have truly universal coverage today in a way that we don't, even with the full implementation of the ACA. Because even after the ACA is fully implemented, there will still be 30 million people without health insurance. So if the goal is universal coverage, the passage of Medicare was not a great advance toward that goal, but a great setback. Great. Um, I, I, uh, Jim, Jim wanted to uh, return to one of your points, and, and maybe we'll just open it up for, for, for anyone. And this, uh, this point you make about uh, the importance of symbols, and um, you, you reference the death panel. I mean, I think to, to paraphrase your point, or one of the implications of your point is, is uh, I, I think at least in this most recent episode, you, um, you, you suggest that the Republicans' conservative opponents are better at demagoguing this issue, and, and Democrats are, are, are grounded in substance and aren't willing to demean themselves and, and, and play on that, same, uh, on that same playing field. And I'd be interested to know uh, what, what Jeremy and, and, and Ovik think. Um, is, this a, is this a reasonable, is this a fair characterization? Yeah, if, if I could just... And I'll, 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 I'll let you... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think in a democratic... Yeah. Uh, in a democratic system, you've got to state things in ways that crystallize very complicated arguments. So democratic is giving it a negative twist. Uh, I, I actually admire the ability to take a very complicated issue and put it your argument in the simplest, most catching terms. So yes, it's demagogy to some extent in, in, the, in the sense that all politics is demagogy. But I, I think it's symbolic politics. And I do, my view is that the Republicans have been more successful. And it may be that whichever party is trying to figure out the details of a policy is always tempted to respond in policy terms. And the party that's simply opposing has an easier time speaking in symbolic terms. But I, I want to put symbolic politics in a, in a slightly more positive light, that that's how you mobilize millions of people about an idea. But I would, I would say, and I'd be interested in what they'll say, um, that my sense of Republicans are much more effective. They're more effective at the Truman moment, and they're more effective during the Obama. I think I'll, I'll twist it a little bit and say this is a lot of snake oil salesman pitches on both the parts of the Democrats and the Republicans. Just a couple examples. When the health savings accounts debate was happening in the 19, late 1990s, Republicans thought this is the answer. We're going to get health savings accounts through for Medicare. Democrats assumed people would flock to the health savings accounts as well. They thought these health savings accounts and Medicare would destroy the original program. They were both wrong. You cannot really listen to what politicians think. They don't have good, great, they just don't have good, they don't know enough, essentially. And often elites don't know enough or policy wonks. We don't know what exactly happened. 
And so I, I think, you know, they assume that these market mechanisms will work, and sometimes they do. But often, they do not. But they cannot say more government regulation. A politician, you know, you get killed if you say that. And even when it happens, prospective payment, which actually worked, DRGs, Jim's an expert about that from the 1980s and 90s, they were still sold as market mechanisms, which is essentially uh, got more government regulation. Um, I also think, um, you know, Medicaid, that would be wonderful if, if it were a better, um, a more um, a more robust system. However, the people who vote tend to be older voters and middle class voters. Even if we just got Medicaid through in 1965, my opinion is it probably would not be that much better of a program today. We may not spend as much on health care, but I would not think so. And I think we have a good uh, uh, example in temporary assistance to needy families. That was the, uh, the new welfare reform after the old uh, AFDC program, 1996. Funding was never really expanded for it. It's now having a whole lot of trouble, a whole lot of trouble. All sorts of problems have emerged. The Obama administration tried in uh, the summer of 2012 to have a, a demonstration project, new demonstration projects. Republicans used to use them. Repu Rick Santorum was a favor of them to try to find ways to improve delivery of TANF. This became a huge issue that was used as a cudgel to clobber Obama with at the Republican convention, ways to find ways around the work incentive of TANF. I'm just afraid that I'm cynical enough that essentially I don't think Medicaid would be that much better, whatever we've done with Medicare, because lower income people tend not to vote so much. But I'm a cynic. Um, there's this old uh, Latin phrase, which I'll botch, but it's something like mm -hmm. silence does not equal consent. So I just want to say, just because I'm not commenting on this, the market doesn't work uh, thesis doesn't mean I agree with it, but I have a, an hour later to address that point. Um, I, I would make one, one, just to respond to Jim, I think Jim is right that Republicans have uh, politically uh, made a lot of, had a lot of success uh, combating uh, the evils of democratic health care plans. But I would say that, that, uh, that those the near-term political victories have come at a, a, a significant price yeah. from a policy standpoint, because today our health care system is much worse, both from a conservative standpoint and from a liberal standpoint, than it could have been had conservatives uh, had health care as a higher policy priority in the way that liberals have historically had. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the history of the American conservative movement. So the American conservative movement really came, uh, came of age in the 50s, after World War II, a group, of, a group of people at National Review and related institutions came together and started to uh, bolt together a kind of a, the libertarians, um, perhaps more traditional, culturally traditional conservatives, and people who were more in, in terms of anti-communist foreign policy hawks, and those three legs became the legs of the, the stool of, of conservatism. Uh, and, and that was in 1955, say, uh, so by the time 1964, 1965 came along when Medicare and Medicaid were passed by Johnson, uh, conservatives for 10 years had really been focused on a lot of other things. They'd been focused on taxes. They'd been focused on communism. They weren't focused on health care. It just wasn't on the, it wasn't, you know, top of mind or even close to top of mind. And so because they kind of let that field uh, go and have ever since, really, uh, that's a large part of the reason why their responses to democratic policy initiatives have been tactical rather than fully thought, thought, thought through, and that's a big problem. And uh, that's, in fact, why I'm sitting here, because I got frustrated with that and, and decided to do something about it. Good point. Well, we, we have reached the end of our session uh, for this morning. Um, I'd like to uh, encourage everyone to attend uh, the next session, which begins at 1 o'clock. We'll be hearing from Overcroy uh, again. And um, please help me in thanking Jim Marone, Jeremy Johnson, and Overcroy. <laughs>